Hello, this is Chapter 5, Observation, from Richard Boleslavsky's Acting, the First Six Lessons. Right, there are a few points in this chapter. Uh, I might take quite a bit of time talking about one of the very brief sentences in this chapter, and then I will cover like the more relevant, important points in the chapter. Okay, so uh, first of all, in the beginning parts of the chapter, uh, the author says just the law of supply and demand in response to the question of the auntie or the creature, right? So this kind of makes me think, um, you know, into a uh, different train of thought, which is also still relevant to what we are discussing and what we are doing about how actors can stay relevant, employable, and find plenty of work. So I relate it a bit to marketing, which is my full-time business. Um, usually in marketing, when we want to market products or services, there are two approaches. Uh, this is just like putting things very basically. Uh, first, the first approach is to find out what the market demands, or the other approach is to create that demand where that demand didn't exist in the first place. So the first approach is actually more straightforward. If the market wants a certain type of product or service, uh, we just have to find the, the best sources of such products or services, add something different and unique, our unique selling points, uh, find it at a great price, mark it up profitably, and offer it to the market, and make profits. Right. But the second approach takes more effort, but it's how brands like Apple, for example, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Apple, I'm not a big fanboy of Apple, I'm just using them as an example. Um, for example, like how Apple create innovative new products, and they generate demand for their new products, by first building up a brand for themselves and the mystique around their brand and then they get their fanboys to lap up everything that they sell. For example, the, uh, the cordless, the wireless uh, earphones, which some people say, you know, it's kind of stupid, but I think you know, a lot more people are catching up with it. But first, before Apple is able to do this, or first before like great brands in the world are able to do this, their brand has to be built up and they must have a reputation for solving problems of the market in innovative ways that are previously, previously unthought of. So similarly for an actor or storyteller, we have to build up our own personal brand and get really good at our craft and uh, so that we can generate market demand for ourselves in a sense. But this can only come about by serving the audience first, by giving the audience what they want as some sort of a psychological bait. And when you build up a reputation slowly, you can slowly build up to what you actually truly want to say to the audience, which if you're given that message at first, might have turned them off. So actors and storytellers, actually, we wield enormous power over the masses, over the people, and we have to use it responsibly. So let me relate to the, like maybe the filmmaking industry, right? For example, about probably 10 or 20 years ago, 15 years ago, movies like Black Panther, Captain Marvel, or something outside the Marvel franchise like Crazy Rich Asians might not do very well if they were released like 10, 15 or 20 years ago. But because of Marvel's precedent in gradually introducing the minority representation in their movies, Marvel have kick-started a new era in more diverse uh, filmmaking and storytelling. But this would not have happened if Marvel did not at first observe and then they serve the demands of the audience and they then gradually introduce these new elements instead of shoving the diversity down the audience throats. Yeah, so uh, this very short sentence about the law of supply and demand, right, just like um, trigger off a new train of thought for me which I find it very relevant and I relate it back to uh, our craft and our art in acting. So I just want to highlight a few points and a few sentences from the chapter which are encapsulate the essences of the teachings of this chapter. Uh, one of it is, the gift of observation must be cultivated in every part of the body, not only in your sight and memory. So this relates to the previous chapter where we talk about uh, characterization in terms of the physical, the mental and the emotional, right? And also uh, how we prepare ourselves physically, mentally, and emotionally, and also spiritually, right? Uh, all these elements have to be taken into, all these aspects and dimensions have to be taken into consideration when we want to do the stuff that we need to do as actors. So first is the preparation, characterization, and observation. All these three things have to address the various dimensions of a human body, of a human being, right? Because a human being is not just a physical body, right? Uh, a human being is also, you know, has the mental element, the psychological element, the spiritual element, the emotional element, and also the, the physical dimension of it. Right? So the gift of observation must be also cultivated in every part of the body. 
another point that I want to highlight is a sentence by Boleslavsky. Um, Madam, I did not teach her anything. We both work in the theatre, and the theatre is one place where teaching and preaching are absolutely excluded. Practice is what counts, and only practice. So this is the beautiful thing about this art, this craft, is in that, yes, there's actually some elements of teaching involved, but the teaching does not take the central role in this art because it is a very practical art. Practice is what counts, and practice really, truly, uh, you know, makes an impact on, on, on the actor's learning and on, on the actor's skills. So it is asked to the author, what use is observation to an, to an actor? It helps a student of the theatre to notice everything unusual and out of ordinary in everyday life. It builds his memory, his storage memory, with all the visible manifestations of the human spirit. It makes him sensitive to sincerity and to make believe. So sensitive to sincerity and to make believe. It develops his sensory and muscular memory and facilitates his adjustment to any business he may be required to do in a part. It opens his eyes to the full extent in appreciation of different personalities and values in people and works of art. And lastly, madame, it enriches his inner life by full and extensive consumption of everything in outward life. Right, so, what does this mean to me is uh, uh, learning to act through this particular school of thought actually enriches human experience. Right? No other practices, except maybe like you practice mindfulness or meditation or other spiritual practices, but uh, this no other school of art like really uh, encourages you to refine your faculties of observation and really experience life as it should be. Right? It really allows you to be present in the moment and on a moment-to-moment -moment basis and observe everything around you, not just the people but also the experiences that you feel, not just the external aspects of it but also the internal aspects, how it affects your mind, your emotions and how that is manifested in the feelings of your body. Right? So it's, 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 it's one of the be most beautiful things about this art that we are doing. And it enriches your inner life by the full and extensive consumption of everything in our life. Yeah? So by, uh, you know, most of us, we go through life um, uh, monotonously, um, automatically, you know, we tend to build up certain habits that we just go through every day very monotonously and very automatically. But this art actually teaches us to really be present and observe and, you know, consume everything that we are experiencing in the outward life which in turn helps to enrich our inner life as well. So it has the same effect, another quote, it has the same effect that one banana and a handful of rice as a day's food have on a Hindu follower of yoga. Okay, maybe kind of a bit uh, anachronistic, yeah, because nowadays anybody also can follow yoga. Uh, consume rightly, getting the maximum energy out of that miserable amount of vitamins, that food gives to a Hindu person immeasurable energy spiritual power and vitality. We consume a steak at lunch and imagine at dinner time that we are hungry. We go through life in the same manner. We think that we see everything and we don't assimilate anything. But in theatre, we have to recreate life. We can't afford that. We are obliged to notice the material with which we work. So it's comparing like the act of observation of an actor to how a person who follows the yoga path, uh, you know, uh, how efficiently they consume their energy and how... Um, efficiently they spend their energy. So just by eating a banana <clears throat> and a handful of rice, they can uh, live life for the entire day. That is enough energy for them to last the entire day. But then he compares to like maybe the Western people who eat a steak at lunch and then by dinner time they're hungry already. So it is because of the inefficient and unoptimal consumption of experiences that such things happen. So he's saying that, you know, uh, by, by doing this acts as a daily practice, it makes us more optimized in terms of our consumption of our experiences and that experience can last us a long time. And then one of the uh, following sentences uh, is recommended to have a daily practice of observation and reenactment. So he says about lunchtime at 12 to 1, he observes everything around uh, him, uh, he observes the people, how they act, how they behave, the tiny little details. And then another hour from one to two, he reenacts that, you know, in in whatever capacity that he can afford to. And just by doing that, just by doing that daily practice of observation and reenactment uh, for at least an hour a day, the actor would have gained more riches than all of Croes's goal, which is the riches of human experience.
And then lastly, he says, we use everything and, every day and, and everybody as an object. The only difference being that we never talk about it, we act it. Right? So again, it goes back to the practical aspect of this graph. It's not just about theory, but also practicality, how we act, how we uh, put into practice what we learn, the theory, how we manifest that theory into practice. Yeah, so this has been my observation of the, on the chapter of observation in the book. I look forward to the next class and uh, see you next week. And that's 10 minutes.